Well, hello. Um, you're most welcome um, uh, to this, my uh, presentation uh, to the ICCMS21 uh, uh, conference. Um, I should start off, first of all, by saying uh, I was delighted to receive um, the invitation from the committee, and in particular from Blessing Thomas, uh, uh, who very kindly uh, invited me to give this uh, presentation to you. Um, I've been working uh, in India for over a decade now, and uh, I have made some very good contacts. Uh, and uh, I, I very much look forward to the point in time where India and indeed Ireland, uh, where I come from, uh, opens up so that I might be able to visit Kerala again uh, and visit St. Thomas's. Um, today I'm going to talk uh, on a, a topic which uh, is very much in vogue at the moment, um, the use of reinforced precast concrete sandwich panels uh, is very much part of the plan to retrofit buildings so that their thermal performance can be improved. And as, as I shall show in this talk, um, there are many choices available to the designer, but a good understanding as to how these panels behave uh, and in particular how they fail uh, is essential if one is going to be successful uh, in implementing this uh, on a wide scale platform uh, on site. I'd like to acknowledge uh, at the outset uh, my two colleagues. Um, there are actually four universities in Dublin and Trinity College Dublin is, is by far the oldest, uh, um, more than 420 years old. And uh, new universities in the University College Dublin, uh, I have two colleagues I've worked with again for over a decade, uh, Dr. Oliver Canan and Dr. Richard O'Hegarty. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, their contributions uh, to this talk and indeed the research which we've done together. Um, so my presentation is split up into three parts. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the various materials uh, which are used in precast sandwich panels. And as you sh sh shall see, uh, um, these really have evolved and are using the latest and highest uh, technology in the concrete technology area. And I want to say a few words about that at the beginning. Um, then I will go on to describe two very significant research programs uh, which we have undertaken. And uh, there were many strands to this over quite a number of years, and I've tried to summarize uh, the work which we've done. First of all, uh, I'm going to talk about a direct shear, and I'll explain what that mo means in a moment, uh, on thick, wide panels uh, using steel plate con connectors. And these are much the more common ones which are used, they're very well established. However, um, with the innovations which I've been talking about, and shall say more about in a moment, um, the indirect shear, and again, I'll explain that in a moment, uh, on thin panels using a more modern uh, non-conductive uh, connectors uh, is something that is very much uh, in vogue. And I want to explain the differences between these and to try and develop an understanding as to how each of these behave. And as you shall see, um, their advantages and disadvantage in their structural performances. Uh, I won't be saying very much today on their thermal performance. I think that's a separate lecture that would take up just as much time. Um, so I'm going to focus on the structural performance. So first of all, a few terms which I'm going to be using, um, whether it's thick or thin precast concrete sandwich panels or PCSPs as they become to be known. Um, <clears throat> there is an interior wall in a conventional load, be load bearing wall. And uh, this would normally be reinforced and it'd be relatively thick. And then there is what would be perhaps known as a rain screen on the outside, which would be a, a, a second plate, if you like, or a second wall. And both of these are, are, are known by the term wides. You can see the term on the top right hand corner there of the picture. Uh, and wides, uh, there's an inner and an outer wide. And uh, they are connected together uh, using a shear connector. And the importance of the shear connector will become obvious to you as I go through the talk. But the standard ones have been around for a very long time and are usually connected by uh, particular types of shear connectors. Um, and they would be, as I say, load bearing and they're typically used for uh, new buildings and they're also used for retrofitting. So if you remove an existing wall and replace it, uh, you, and it's a load bearing wall, of course, you might go for one of these thicker standard PCSPs. On the other hand, um, if you're uh, re perhaps retrofitting or more likely over cladding, that is where you simply add the cladding to the outside of an existing facade so that you enhance the uh, thermal performance uh, to try and bring it up to a modern standard of thermal performance. 
uh, and there are very good carbon reasons for doing that, of course, and it's a widespread problem throughout the world in those places which need insulation in the walls. And um, then the tin PCPs make a lot more sense rather than adding weight to foundations and adding in uh, uh, walls that don't need to be load bearing. So the tin PCSPs are quite a different technology and indeed they use uh, uh, different types of concrete and different uh, insulation types perhaps. And also uh, they also use different shear connectors. And I hope uh, uh, I can make that clear to you uh, as the talk proceeds. So just say a few words about the materials to start with. So first of all, the insulation types, and I've listed a few of the insulation types and they are only a few. Uh, uh, and I've included there the thermal conductivities because these are very important. In terms of the thermal transmittance or the U value as it's sometimes known, uh, that is the ease with which heat can escape from one side to the other. Uh, um, then the uh, type of insulation that you use and the thickness of that insulation becomes very important. And as the years and decades proceed, um, we tend in our structures become more and more uh, uh, demanding of the insulation. So for example, on the right hand side, you can see uh, three different walls, all with the same wide thicknesses, inner and outer. And um, the thing about these three is they're using different types of insulation material as per the thermal conductivity on the left. And the, the best, the one with the best thermal conductivity, that's the lowest value, is the, the VIPs or the vacuum insulation. And then one of the more typically used ones, as you'll see why structurally in due course, are the expanded polystyrenes. So all three of these walls, there's clearly a difference between their overall thickness, but they all have the same U value. And what we realize from a structural viewpoint is that if you're using the vacuum insulation, um, then getting a shear coupling between the two is less of a challenge or less demanding than if you're using the insulation uh, on the right hand side, where there's a larger space between the two wides. So this poses us as structural engineers uh, as that gap becomes wider, as the demands uh, uh, on the thermal performance of the wall increases, the amount of insulation that's included increases, and therefore trying to get a composite uh, behavior between the inner and outer walls so that they act together uh, in bending or in flexure and indeed in shear uh, is quite a challenge. The more insulation you put in, the more of a challenge it becomes. So this is what has given rise to a lot of this research worldwide uh, in, in relation to the composite behavior of these sandwich panels. Um, again, I'm just looking at the basic um, mechanical properties of the materials just at the moment. And if you take a standard piece of insulation, and we've done this with quite a number of them, but let me just show one of them. You can see a piece of insulation there where there's a circular disc and we apply a load to that simply in compression. Um, if you apply uh, it to a certain point, as you can see in the diagram in the middle, um, you get relatively linear response. Uh, and, and as you can see here, the, the insulation has a load capacity of about uh, maybe half a kilonewton in the case of this particular insulation. Um, on the other hand, it does depend on the type of insulation you have. And you do reach a point, of course, uh, uh, where you reach the elastic limit. And the diagram on the right hand side uh, is looking at two types. Uh, uh, um, an extruded and an expanded polystyrene, and the XPS uh, is the one that performs much better, as you can see. So here again, um, the diagram in the middle is just in the elastic range, but when we exceed the elastic range, which will very often happen in the experiments I'm about to describe, then uh, while the XPS is certainly stiffer, you reach a plateau where in fact the insulation is crushing uh, underneath uh, the application of uh, a displacement as it happens. Um, you're not, it's not a, a load test per se, you're actually moving the head of the uh, actuator uh, uh, at a given displacement. Perhaps one millimeter per minute might be a typical value. And you can see that there's a plateau in the XPS curve where in fact, um, as the insulation crushes underneath that load, there is a ongoing and continu continuing load capacity. In other words, it doesn't collapse. So if you control the displacement and how the displacement is applied, um, you'll find that there's a residual load uh, which can resist that. Now, the reason why um, the XPS curve uh, then starts to stiffen up uh, is because uh, you get to a stage where you've crushed it so much that you start uh, engaging the lower platen as the two plates move towards each other. So we can, for the purposes of practical uh, uh, displacements, we can ignore uh, the right-hand side of the XPS curve. Now the EPS, of course, behaves in, a, in not an identical way, but quite a similar way insofar as um, there's quite a big difference in the stiffness to start with. There's a very big difference in the, local, the um, 
uh, continual and re uh, residual load capacity, uh, 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 but the EPS does have a residual capacity. So what we find is that uh, in terms of the uh, PCSPs, which we'll be looking at, is that it would be much more usual to an XPS, because as we shall find out, we're going to rely on the, the um, load resistance of the insulation to some degree, to some minor degree, as we shall see. We should say a few words about the uh, two, uh, about the types of uh, connectors as well. So the ones on the left-hand side are the much more conventional ones. And that is uh, um, at its crudest, you could have a concrete uh, webs and uh, a complete composite, full composite action between the two. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the disadvantage of that, of course, is that you've created uh, an enormous thermal bridge between the outside face and the inside face. And therefore there's a lot of thermal losses through this bridging. So uh, as we aim higher and higher in respect of our thermal efficiency, um, this type of concrete web has become much less fashionable and indeed not acceptable. On the other hand, uh, we, we could, instead of using concrete webs, use the thin plates. And the thing, as you can see here about a thin plate, is um, you, you've got a, chi a choice on the, on the plate size, of course. Uh, but you can also see that you can put in rebar. You might put in maybe a six or a millimeter diameter bars, which would thread to a number of holes. Uh, you put the insulation in between and you have it embedded on either side of the web. And that would give you a, a good, you hope anyway, would give you a very good shear transfer uh, between the two, very effective shear transfer, particularly at the elastic uh, uh, range of the loading. So those are typical examples of the conductive shear connectors, and they both suffer from the same problem of uh, thermal bridging and lower thermal behavior. Um, the more modern ones, of which there are quite a few, on the right-hand side are the non-conductive shear connectors. So I've just given you two examples here of FRP grids. Um, for example, they, they, they could be carbon uh, reinforced, or they could be glass reinforced, could be basalt reinforced, whatever they are. Uh, but you can see the grid shape there in the top right hand corner. Uh, and the idea is that the very top of the grid would be embedded in the top wide and the bottom would be embedded in the, in the bottom wide and hopefully bonded between them. Uh, and you can see uh, an exploded view of that uh, to see what the grid actually looks like. Or alternatively, you could put uh, FRP studs put in a particular spacing uh, uh, and um, where you see uh, the yellow uh, um, separator, the top part of that would be embedded in the top wise and be, there'd be a similar one uh, out, out of view of the picture on the bottom, which would uh, embed itself into the bottom wide. So you would hope that you would get again good bond between the two in the hopes of developing uh, um, uh, basically composite behavior between the inner and outer wides. Um, just to show you some of the properties of these uh, on the left hand side in the table, and again, you can digest these uh, in, in your own time, but I just point out a few things. For example, the, the concrete is relatively low tensile strength, as we know, uh, and it has a particular thermal conductivity value, but the steel plates, while they're much, you could imagine more beneficial if they're built in with reinforcing bars uh, at either end, uh, and they do have very high thermal conductivity, so the flow of heat through those is actually quite fast. Um, so neither of those two are highly desirable. Um, on the other hand, uh, one of the disadvantages, for example, of the grid uh, uh, FRPs is if you look at the diagram on the right hand side where um, a, a, a tensile test was done on them first at the top right hand quadrant of that diagram, you can see that uh, as the grid spacing becomes smaller, in other words, you get a more dense matrix uh, of the mesh, uh, um, you get a slightly better or slightly improved performance as the stress are very high, as you can see, up to 600 uh, megapascals uh, in compressive, uh, in tensile strength, I beg your pardon. Uh, but of course, they're relatively floppy, so to speak, a rather non-technical word. What that means is that they're not very good, uh, not very good at all when it comes to compressing them. So if you look at the compress compression results uh, when a compressive load is applied uh, in the bottom left-hand uh, uh, quadrant, uh, you can see that again, you, that there is a, a, a particular response. But the key thing is to notice that uh, the axis has been changed. So we're only talking about one or two megapascals of stress before they actually buckle, they effectively buckle. And um, so they got very poor buckling resistance. And this is a disadvantage of the uh, uh, grid type uh, connectors. Of course, if you're using the, um, the, 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 the pin type, uh, uh, which is the one that I, I showed you previously, and um, they obviously have a much more rigid uh, uh, axial resistance in compression uh, uh, and tend not to buckle. Uh, so therefore they will be better at transmitting compressive forces and as well, hopefully as tensile forces and stresses. Uh, 
in, in terms of the uh, types of behavior that occur in the flexural uh, testing of, of these types of uh, panels. Um, I should say something as well about the concrete types. Um, so the concrete, um, uh, uh, there are many different types of concrete available, of course, and this is evolving all the time. Um, I've just given you a list here. It's not comprehensive by any means. Uh, um, there is a list of acronyms on the left-hand side, which we'll read in a lot of the literature. Uh, and uh, we're not really looking at the ordinary normal Portland cement type concretes anymore. Um, we're going much more towards the lower end where particularly when you come down to very thin withes, you're almost certainly talking about an ultra high performance concrete. Uh, you're almost certainly talking about fibers because they're not thick enough uh, to be able to put in a rebar and still protect the steel against corrosion. So you have to use a fibers, particularly as the concrete strength is very high and you, re you require um, uh, additional uh, toughness of, of the concrete. Uh, uh, in order to get it uh, to perform with some type of post-cracking toughness, as we shall see when we come to test these. So, so there's quite a wide range of those. Uh, textile reinforcement, for example, is an alternative. Um, geopolymers are alternatives, again, to uh, using conventional um, uh, cementitious materials. And um, the carbon footprint of a lot of these, again, is something that can be examined separately, not something I'm going to do here. But you can see there's a wide range of them. And I've just provided, in my own words, a short description uh, of each one of those to see what choices you have in terms of the, the thicker wides and the thinner wides. And um, to give you an idea as to how the mixed designs work, um, let's take mix A, which is the second column along, and just take a conventional concrete. And in that conventional concrete, um, typically, for example, supposing it's a 30 megapascal cube strength, uh, we, we use cubes, not cylinders in Ireland, uh, but supposing it's a 30 megapascal cube strength, would say a typical cube strength at 28 days of 37 meg megapascals and perhaps somewhere around about uh, six or seven megapascals in, in, in flexure. And um, then if you look at the mixed constituents, I just draw your attention to the items in red. So first of all, in column A, uh, we're using a 10 millimeter crushed stone because if our wide is only 30 or 40 millimeters thick, we tend not to want to have 20 millimeter stone. So 10 millimeter crushed stone is, is, is the usually the largest size that we use on these thin elements. And um, if we then move across to looking at a much higher strength concrete, one thing we're going to have to do is substantially change the water cement ratio, which is the third row from the bottom. So we've gone from a 0.53 water cement ratio to 0.33. And we've included, as you can see at the top, uh, we've included um, slag and silica fume, uh, two very conventional materials to use in order to Im improve the uh, performance of the concrete in, in both uh, strength, compressive strength and in flexure. You'll also notice that we've uh, re I've reduced the um, crushed limestone content and put in instead a calcium carbonate filler. Uh, and there, there are several proprietary products like this which are available. And the thinking behind this is that it helps uh, in terms of the particle packing. So this is very much a particle packing exercise where you try and fill as much of the voids as you can uh, to have a much densely, more densely packed concrete uh, uh, in order to um, increase the strength. So moving on to column C then, um, we, we add some fibers uh, as is necessary, of course, with the higher strengths to overcome the brittle behavior and to give us post-cracking -tough, post tough, uh, toughness. Um, so when you add those in, you can see there is a, a measurable increase, but not only in the compressive strength, but in the tensile strength as well. And then we move on to uh, column D where um, it's very much uh, part of what we do is to not only reduce the, uh, conventional SEM1, which is a Portland cement, uh, traditionally a Portland cement uh, based cement, um, to include uh, alternative cementitious materials, which are recycled materials. So it will have a lower carbon footprint, substantially a lower carbon footprint. But we should also do the same with the aggregates. So we've replaced in full the limestone aggregate with a recycled concrete aggregate in full, 100%, as you can see. And uh, the disadvantage, of course, of that is that with the adhered mortar on the aggregate and the higher uh, water suction out of the mix is that we tend to lose some strength when we do that. And the way we compensate for that in column E is, is to lower the water content, which reduces the water cement ratio from 0.33 down to 0.25. And that then gives us a very satisfactory uh, um, concrete strength for this very thin wide we're going to use of around about 90 uh, megapascals uh, compressive strength or you know, around about 13 or 14 uh, uh, um, flexural strength, in other words, uh, strength in tension effectively. So that gives you some idea of the way mixes evolve uh, when we're using these uh, very 
wide variety of materials uh, for the wides in order to improve the uh, concrete technology performance. So um, the second of three parts of my talk will, will deal with uh, direct shear. And I'm going to start uh, very, with very conventional uh, um, wides. And um, these are panels that were all made in a, a ready mix, uh, sorry, a precast plant, should I say, uh, uh, with a, a very well-established uh, manufacturer of these panels. And um, the panels themselves uh, were test panels and they were one meter square uh, on the face. And um, as you can see from the diagram on the left, the schematic on the left-hand side, is that there is a steel frame against which the inner withe, which is the thicker withe, is bolted. And then we have uh, three layers of insulation, as you can see on the right-hand side in the photograph. And then the outer withe, uh, is attached uh, and it's a much thinner wide because it's only a rain screen uh, and this would be a load bearing panel where the inside layer would be reinforced and be load bearing. Um, you can also see um, that the loading application here is uh, in effect the support is that um, the inner wide is bolted to the frame but there's also a rectangular steel uh, beam uh, you can see it both in the schematic on the left and the photograph on the right in white. Uh, there's a beam sitting underneath that so that it cannot move vertically. And then we have a load spreader and a jacking arrangement at the top uh, on the left-hand side, uh, which means that only the outer wide has this direct uh, lateral shear, if you like, or vertical shear on the element. So this is not an element in flexure, it's in pure shear. And the only thing which is connecting the outer uh, uh, wise to the inner one uh, is two of the steel plates that you saw earlier, and there are, there are only two of them at uh, mid mid panel height. Uh, there are only two of them, uh, and, um, and they are of course embedded with steel bars on both sides. So I'm going to be just giving you some examples of the types of results, and I'm going to have to refer to some of the geometry. So I thought I'd show this diagram to you as we have concrete wives on either side, <clears throat> some thinner than others. Um, and we have a plate thick, thickness, which is T, which is out of the plane of this slide. We have a plate width, uh, WP is the term that's used for that, the width of the plate. And then the width of the cavity, because they're obviously the plate is embedded on either side, is WC. And then the depth of the plate uh, is D. D is the symbol we use for that. So all of these parameters, T, WC, WP, and D, are going to play uh, some part in the typical way in which uh, this panel, the sandwich panel behaves when the direct shear is applied. And I thought I'd just go straight in there and show you some results that we get. Um, so looking at the diagram on the right, first of all, which is simply uh, the left-hand diagram with uh, just four millimeters of displacement shown on the right and up to 25 millimeters on the left. So it's just blown up. Uh, and what you can see here is that for um, a given depth of plate of 160 millimeters uh, as uh, sorry I beg your pardon um, uh, width of plate should I say uh, um, what we have is different depth plates and you can see that the depth of the plate makes a significant difference uh, uh, in particular obviously the deeper the plate becomes um, the better the shear resistance and in particular uh, you can see that when we use a 400 millimeter deep plate um, we get a, an elastic response uh, at the start uh, and then because of the depth of the plate what tends to happen is remember we have a shear load is that the plate actually shears in buckling uh, uh, when we have a two millimeter thick plate it shears in buckling and then um, the outer wide starts to rotate because of the buckling uh, as the entire outer one rotates in an anti-clockwise way and then the insulation is compressed and the buckling resistance, together with the compressive resistance of the insulation, gives us that uh, post-peak behavior. So the post-peak behavior you can see in the diagram on the left is very much uh, uh, due to um, ongoing uh, buckling of the plate and uh, uh, compression of the insulation as the outer wire rotates. And you can also see, obviously, there's a quite a significant difference in the initial stiffness in the right-hand diagram, uh, depending on the depth of the plate. 
Um, so in order to get a feel for what the numbers mean, uh, we had to do some repeatability tests. Um, and so I've shown here, uh, for, uh, a, for example, on the left-hand side, a given depth of 80 millimeters uh, um, uh, using a cavity width of 240 for all the ones here and a plate thickness of three millimeters. You can see that ones which are ostensibly supposed to be identical, uh, you can see that in the first three rows of the, of the data uh, for the ultimate force, there is a bit of variability there. If, on the other hand, we increase the depth to 240, and you can see a, a step jump in the uh, ultimate force, so it goes up significantly in terms of its strength. And then if we increase the depth again, in accordance with the previous diagram, uh, if it goes up to 400 millimeters, you can see that we see, uh, again, some quite a bit of variability, but you can see um, that there's a clump of results which are together. So very significant improvement depending on the pace, uh, depth of the plate. So you can see the importance here of the depth of the plate uh, with three millimeter depth. So we did just a little bit of analysis on that, and I don't believe that a 95% confidence interval means too much when you've only got three data uh, um, terms. But uh, happily, uh, even if you look at the 95% confidence interval, uh, which is in the middle of the table here, you can see that there's enough difference between these plates, given the change in their depth, to be able to categorize uh, the significant influence of the depth of the plate uh, uh, up to quite significant uh, values of uh, failure load. Uh, you know, between 10 and uh, 23 tons uh, um, uh, could be the type of results that you would get. Um, <clears throat> so we, we've undertaken a whole array of different results, and uh, uh, you can look at these yourselves in detail if you, if you wish, but I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, uh, perhaps a difference, and it's just off the, hope you can see it on the screen there, um, but it's just off the screen uh, uh, with my, with my uh, video there, but I can see that it's two millimeters at the top right-hand corner, but with a two millimeter deep plate, uh, if you look at the depths, again, ranging from 80 up to 400 as before, you can see the ultimate, ultimate forces uh, uh, for these vary from 30 to 102 to 170. So you can see, again, the typical type of range that you get uh, when you do that. That's with a two millimeter uh, deep plate. And I'm going to refer to that in a moment. So I would just ask you to remember those numbers, 30, about 100, and about 170. Um, and you can see the difference that the plate width uh, uh, takes as well, insofar as the wider the cavity, the wider the cavity. So the cavities here in the third column go from 90 to 110 uh, to an exceptional one of 120 and then a 160. You can see the ultimate uh, forces uh, are changing substantially uh, for each one of those. If we just take the, the one case for the 80 millimeter depth, it goes from uh, 80 to uh, down to 36. Uh, down to 30. So the, as you can imagine, as the cavity width gets wider for the same depth, uh, the um, composite behavior is more difficult, more, more challenging, as I said before, and therefore the ultimate force drops as the width increases, not surprisingly. So what we've seen now is, uh, particularly if you have a, a relatively narrow width, um, for the different uh, uh, deep, should I say, plates, uh, as the as the as the widths, uh, the cavity widths change, uh, what we find uh, is that um, if you take the one with 90 millimeter cavity uh, with an 80 millimeter deep deep width, is that's almost square. And what you find is that uh, the plate, instead of buckling because it's it's relatively. Uh, um, uh, the cavity width uh, is, is relatively shallow. What it means is that that plate is actually going to rotate rather than buckling. So the behavior is quite different. And as it rotates, in other words, the bottom bar or the top bar, there'll be a tendency to pull out. So as it rotates, it'll be the top bar that tends to pull out as it rotates counterclockwise. And as a consequence, the insulation again goes into compression. Uh, and that is what's responsible for the resistance against that rotation and the, the insulation and compression, which gives us that increase in load capacity as the displacement is increasing. Remember, this is a displacement control test. So again, with three millimeter deep plates, um, I'm just I'm going to look at exactly, more or less exactly the same case, just slightly different. Uh, it was 160 cavity before, it's 180 here, but we're using the same depths. And with those same depths, I've reproduced the numbers on the right just to uh, remind you. So the numbers we had before for two millimeters were 30, 100, and 170. And the results for three millimeter thick plates is about 65, 135, and 240. So you can see a substantial increase by increasing the thickness. And there's a very good reason for this, and that is that um, uh, most of the two millimeter thick plates uh, actually uh, buckled, uh, uh, whereas the three millimeter 
tick plates uh, um, tended not to buckle until much later in the loading phase. So it wasn't the initial cause of the peak uh, uh, value of the uh, ultimate force. Uh, um, there was other reasons, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, uh, for uh, the, these plates actually failing. So it seems for this, these particular geometries of cavity widths and depths of plate, um, the thickness becomes very important in determining the mode of failure. And in, in fact, the two millimeter plates uh, generally tended to fail prematurely because buckling dominated the failure mode. So if you increase the thickness, of course, you'll get higher uh, forces, uh, higher strain capacities uh, as a consequence of uh, eliminating this uh, uh, unfortunate uh, um, lower lower force buckling of the thinner plates. And you can see this quite clearly uh, if we just um, draw a graph of what is effectively the aspect ratio, the depth against the width uh, compared to the yield load. Um, there's a clear pattern there between the two millimeter thick ones, which are the red ones, and uh, the blue ones, which uh, clearly have higher capacity. So all of those two millimeter, almost all of those two millimeter ones, particularly at the higher end of the aspect ratio, would, it would have suffered significantly from um, uh, plate uh, problems, uh, plate buckling uh, problems. So let me show you what some of these would uh, look like. So um, obviously uh, there was insulation in uh, all but a few. We did test some without insulation to see the, uh, um, the contribution of the insulation, that's true. Uh, but what we did with all of them is we removed the insulation afterwards. And that meant that we could see the condition of the plate uh, uh, inside. And here's a good example, as you can see, uh, of a wide which is rotated very substantially uh, underneath. Uh, remember, it's only a vertical load. There is no lateral uh, flexural loads here. It's a pure vertical shear load here. And you can clearly see that the wide has rotated uh, um, during uh, the um, post uh, peak behavior. So we pushed it very much beyond um, the normal value because we wanted to see what happened to secondary uh, mechanisms, not just the primary mechanism, but also to see the secondary mechanisms. So let's take uh, the top left hand, which were the shallowest of depth of plates to the bottom right hand corner, which are the deepest plates. And let me just talk you quickly through A to F. So A, as you can see, are the ones with the wider cavity gaps and the, D and the shallower plates. And you can clearly see that rotation is taking place. And um, de uh, depending on how you change the ratio of the width to the depth, um, you can go from A to F. So the next stage is to get a horizontal crack on the outer face uh, um, at perhaps an early stage, with a little bit of spalling, as you can see, as the plates are basically pushing through. Um, then you can get cracks occurring right through the thickness of the wides themselves in C. Moving on to D, then there's evidence uh, uh, of actual pullout. So this is where the actual rebar started to appear on the inside as, as at the bottom of the plate, the rebar started to uh, appear. And then on the outside, we started to get face bursting where uh, large pieces of or shards of concrete uh, would come off the surface, uh, particularly with the deeper plates. And then of the deepest of plates, perhaps accompanying E and F together, or F as a secondary mechanism later on, uh, is, as you can see, a clear uh, a buckling uh, of the plate, a shear buckling uh, of the plate. And that still has, of course, some load resistance, which together with the insulation means that it doesn't fail very suddenly, is we get, as we saw earlier, this post-buckling behavior. Um, so uh, just to take a look at the failure modes, so uh, these are the same results as we had before, but I've highlighted the aspect ratio. And what we find is that for the high aspect ratio, which is in the middle column, if you look at the failure modes on the right hand side, where OR stands for rotate, B for buckle and P stands for pull out, we can clearly see a pattern emerging where for high aspect ratios, um, uh, we tend to get rotation first and then buckling. For the very low one, the lowest ones at the bottom of the table, we tend to get pull out first and then buckling. But what you'll notice is in all of them, buckling occurs at some particular stage with the two millimeter plate, either as the primary mode in some of the middle ones uh, to uh, either the primary followed by other secondary modes. So um, the first named letter, of course, is the first mode to occur primary. So um, if you compare this then with the three millimeter plate, uh, if you look at the higher aspect ratio, as you can see uh, on the right hand side is the rotation still occurs, but no buckling. And uh, at the lower uh, examples, again, we get pullout occurring with no buckling. And in fact, there was only one case of buckling in all of these. So when we go to a three, three millimeter thickness of plate, uh, uh, we seem to avoid the, the low 
uh, ultimate forces as which we saw before. So the, 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 the guidance then for designers is the first thing to do is to make sure your plate is thick enough to avoid these premature failures at low ultimate forces. And then once you've done that, then you can decide whether you want to go for a high aspect ratio, uh, uh, which will have the rotations, that is for the shallower plates, if you like, the ones which are less deep, or you can go for a deeper one, uh, which will have a higher capacity and is more likely to attract a pullout, uh, or, or if it's a thinner plate, uh, uh, the buckling. So we have plotted all these uh, together on the one uh, diagram, and uh, uh, so that the same letters apply here, and I've tried to group them together, where you can clearly see that the rotations happen when the plates are particularly shallow or the widths are particularly wide. Uh, and that makes sense, I think, uh, um, that they would rotate, uh, and they tend to be for high aspect ratios, as you can see. On the other hand, um, the buckling ones, particularly for the two millimeter ones, which are the ones in black, and the three millimeters are the ones in red, the, the data points, um, you can clearly see that uh, there's a great propensity for them to buckle uh, for low aspect ratios, <coughs> excuse me, and the pullout uh, uh, can occur, uh, particularly uh, with the uh, uh, the lower aspect ratios for the thicker for the thicker plates. So this diagram here gives us a good uh, idea as to what type of plate we might go for, depending on what ultimate force uh, you want the uh, PCP uh, uh, PS uh, the, the the sandwich panel uh, uh, to um, resist what uh, uh, direct shear load. You can make a decision then as to what uh, plate arrangement you need. Just by way of comparison, because um, these are two quite thick wides, and um, supposing one of your wides is relatively thin, or even both of them are relatively thin, but supposing both of them are relatively thin. Um, so we did a test on a thin panel. So this is a completely different panel shown on the left-hand side. This is a, a direct shear force being applied horizontally this time instead of vertically. It was just more convenient to test so that way. You can see the actuator in green on the left-hand side in the photograph. Uh, you can see the load spreader in white, uh, and we're only pushing the top wide with insulation, of course, in between. Uh, uh, and um, we have the bottom wide is not allowed to move laterally. And if you look at the diagram, you can see the stages because one thing I haven't mentioned is there is some contribution in terms of the shear resistance from the bond between the insulation and the concrete. I don't think that's something we should be relying too much on, but it does exist. So if you look at the displacement against load curve, where again, I just emphasize that this is a displacement control test. So what we're doing is we're allowing the head of the actuator to move at one millimeter a minute and measuring the residual load capacity laterally, uh, uh, the top compared to the bottom wides. So we get the linear proportion first, uh, and then we get a debonding uh, uh, of the, uh, the either the top or the bottom, depending on the circumstances. In this case, it was the bottom. Uh, we got a debonding of the uh, insulation, so now it's free to move. Um, we did have uh, some pins in here. I mentioned the pins before. So these are the stiff, uh, uh, um, uh, shear connectors, FRP, uh, um, fiber reinforced polymer uh, pins. And they actually manage to hold the two parts together. And as it starts to move laterally, uh, it helps to, as it rotates, it helps to bring compression into the insulation. Uh, and then eventually the, 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 the FRP ties, which are not designed for lateral loads, they're designed uh, to transfer in this particular case, because they're vertical here, connecting the top wide to the bottom wide, they're designed to take load from the top wide to the bottom one in flexure, not in shear. So you can imagine uh, that they start to fail when they move laterally as they basically, they, they, they move laterally uh, sideways uh, and they become less effective. And then ultimately all the ties uh, uh, fail and we get, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, which is after the test, a very significant uh, lateral movement. If you look at the um, right hand side in the right hand photograph, you can actually see clearly that the bottom, uh, uh, sorry, the top uh, uh, wide and the insulation have moved together very substantially to the right, while the bottom one hasn't moved at all. So this is just to give an indication as to how an FRP pin might work uh, in a direct shear. However, um, uh, direct shear uh, is not something that you expect a, a thin wide to be experiencing. It's much more likely to be used uh, as a vertical element, uh, resisting wind load and perhaps impact loadings uh, on that vertical element. And therefore, because it's much thinner, the flexural behavior becomes much more important. 
So if you look at this uh, arrangement here for a, a typical flexural load, which is a simply supported beam, it's relatively thin, as you can see. Uh, we tend to put uh, um, displacement transducers at various points to measure what's going on. We have a load cell applying a load in the middle. And as you can see, it's relatively thin. So just to say that we're probably as engineers uh, very used to drawing shear force diagrams and to dealing with the transverse or the vertical shear on this element. So the bending moment which will inevitably arise gives rise, of course, to a, a vertical or transverse shear, which enables us to draw a shear force diagram. But we shouldn't forget that if we don't have composite behavior, we don't have a monolithic beam or a slab, and that means that there is uh, also, and it always exists, a significant lateral shear. So just to illustrate that, to you, and I'm sure you're all very much aware of it, but it's a good illustration, is if you take a ream of paper as seen on the left-hand photograph, and you then just bend it with your hand as shown in the middle photograph. So that now has a bending moment. And then you hold the left-hand end so that it can't move, and you release the right-hand end. Then what you will find, as in the right-hand diagram, is that during the bending procedure, almost every single one of the sheets have actually slid horizontally over each other indicating that there has been a horizontal shear, that is a lateral shear, as a consequence of this transverse load that we've applied, the moment that we've applied. And this, of course, doesn't normally happen quite so dramatically as this, because, of course, we have a shear interaction between the two, which prevents uh, the type of shear movement you can see on the right. In fact, normally when we take a load off in an elastic situation, uh, we end up with a beam that looks like the photograph on the left. In other words, there's no permanent movement. And of course, that movement wants to take place, but it's not taking place normally. So therefore, there must be a lateral shear. And I think this is a good illustration in case we forget that it's not just the transverse shears we need to work, kind of punching shears or the typical shears that we get near the supports for which we have to provide shear steel. And um, that's not what we're talking about here. In this particular case, we're much more interested in the lateral shear that takes place uh, because it's thin and it's flexible, of course. And we're also going to add fibers. And uh, in case you're not familiar with the consequences of adding a significant quantity, not a small quantity, but a significant quantity of fibers, let me just remind you or show you uh, is that the red curve here is typically what happens again in a displacement control test uh, where we increase the displacement very gradually. And in plain concrete, in your traditional uh, uh, standardized beam test, which is a 600 millimeter span and 100 millimeter cross section to that concrete plain concrete beam is the concrete fails suddenly in a very brittle way. Um, uh, so you can see here that if we're taking readings every, every um, maybe every 15 or 10 seconds, you can see that the beam fails uh, extremely quickly. Now, what happens when we put a, a high dosage of appropriate fibers, and uh, I won't dwell on that today, but you would expect if you're uh, expecting a lot of uh, uh, increased toughness and flexural resistance, you'd expect that to be a longer fiber, certainly a, perhaps a steel fiber, and certainly you'd expect it to be perhaps hooked or fibrillated. But either way, um, the influence of that is the concrete still cracks, as you can see indicated there with the arrow. Concrete still cracks, but then it transfers the load into the uh, fiber. And now the fiber enhances the strength if it's there in sufficient quantities. Uh, it prevents that crack from opening up substantially. And then when you reach a, a peak value, you get into a phase where there's a lot of post-cracking ductility. Now we need to be careful with the use of that word, post-cracking uh, toughness. Sorry, I said ductility, I didn't mean to say that, toughness. And the reason for that is that um, what happens here is the fibers tend to pull out. So they have a pull out resistance. So you do need a force to pull those fibers out. So the fibers bond the sides of the crack together. So as a consequence, because we're increasing the displacement, there is a residual load capacity in the beam. And that load capacity is used to pull the fibers out gradually. So on this, uh, it's not quite a plateau, but this falling load uh, uh, with uh, flexural stress, should I say, uh, with increasing displacement, um, we've got very good uh, toughness performance. So there's a lot more energy being stored uh, in the structure as more and more displacement take place. But please be aware um, that um, the fibers themselves are very unlikely to have reached their elastic limit and they're very unlikely to have become plastic. So although this uh, demonstrates what some people call ductile behavior, it's not the fibers themselves that have become ductile, but it is post-cracking toughness, 
which is an indication of the area underneath the loading curve uh, uh, post cracking. So I think that's um, well understood, uh, but it's important in terms of trying to understand the diagrams which are about to follow. So let's start with the simplest of cases where we have a single uh, short span. So this is not a long span, but it's a relatively short span, uh, 900 millimeters span, and we have a 600 millimeter wide uh, slab, if you'd like to call it a slab or a plate. And uh, we're applying, uh, as you can see in the diagram at the bottom right, through a load spreader, we're applying a central load. Uh, we've got some strain gauges on there, which we don't need to worry about at the moment. Um, but what we see is, again, we get um, a, an elastic response, and at the point A, the concrete cracks. So that's the end of the elastic limit, and the load is now uh, either shared with or spread to the fibers, depending on how you look on it, at around about two and a half kilonewtons of load. And now, as I said before, um, the plateau which we get is an indication of post-cracking toughness. The fibers uh, gradually pull out. Uh, perhaps there might be a little slip. So you can see at the point C, there's a little slip as perhaps a number of fibers pull out, but other fibers take over. And even after 30, 35 millimeters of displacement, which is a large displacement over a 90 mill 900 millimeter span, you can see there's still quite a substantial percentage of the peak load is still there. So indicating very good post-cracking uh, toughness. And <laughs> just to emphasize, this is measured by the load cell within the uh, actuator system, which is an indication of the residual load capacity of the, of the slab. It's not an applied load, it's an applied displacement, and this indicates that there's still residual load capacity in the slab. If you look at the uh, photograph on the right-hand side, um, you probably can't see it all that well, but there is a, a well developed crack there uh, and the crack is gradually opening uh, and you can see the crack width is slowly growing but it certainly hasn't failed um, don't worry about the very large increase in load towards the end uh, that's where it actually uh, deflected so much it, it, it bared up against uh, the lower uh, support of beam there's a there's a there's a, a beam underneath it to stop it from collapsing in a heap uh, so it started to touch that so then we started testing the beam underneath which we're not interested in so um, ignore everything from 35 millimeters on. That's not relevant to what we're talking about. So this matter of composite behavior is very important because if you have one uh, uh, wise or one slab or one beam, uh, it doesn't have any choice but to effectively go into compression in the top and tension in the bottom in the loading arrangement, which I've described. However, when you have two of these, which may be separated by insulation, um, the composite behavior becomes uh, much uh, more of interest and much more problematic. Because uh, if you look at the diagram on the left hand side, if we take the two wides behaving independently and separately, perhaps separated by some insulation which keeps them in place, what you find in diagram B on the left hand side is the two wides effectively behave independently. They both bend about their own neutral axes and the top surface goes into compression, the bottom into tension in both. What we'd very much like to see, whatever way we do it, is we'd like to have shear connectors between the top and the bottom, which are sufficiently good to be able to act, it, act fully compositely. And if that's the case, then we can go back to the diagram on the left, diagram A, where we get full composite behavior, where the entirety of the top wides goes into compression and the entirety of the bottom wides goes into tension. Of course, this type of full composite behavior is very difficult to achieve. So what we're much more likely to get somewhere in between A and B is case C. And in case C, we'll find that compression dominates but it's not the only type of stress in the top. And in the bottom, of course, tension dominates, but it's not the only type of uh, um, uh, stress which occurs in the bottom. Um, I've given some equations there uh, just for some elastic calculations, that's all. And what you'll find, of course, is that if you get composite behavior, the uh, second moment of area, the I value as it's known, uh, is substantially higher, of course, uh, like perhaps 30, 40, or 50 times higher if you can get good composite action. And therefore, the deflections are less, and obviously uh, the, the stresses uh, are, are significantly reduced as well. So this composite action is very important as to whether or not we just have two Ys which are behaving on their own, which would take much lower loads uh, in practice than if we managed to get some uh, partial uh, composite behavior. Um, so let me take the first case of unconnected panels. So these, this is um, where we cast the bottom slab first. Uh, we then cast the upper panel or the upper Ys. Uh, we then simply placed 
some insulation without any bonding, and we put the top wire on top of it, and we applied a load as previously. And uh, we did that for uh, XPS, which is the, is the stiffer of the two and the stronger of the two insulations, and EPS, just to compare them. But because of a time constraint here, I'm just going to give you the result for the XPS. So let's take a look at what happens. So as it settles down to start with, between B and C, the bottom wide is much stiffer. So therefore, the upper wide is like sitting on an elastic foundation where there's an elastic response of the insulation as we apply it. What I mean by that is that um, if you look at the diagram on the left, the LVDTs 2 and 5 will also experience a vertical movement because we're squashing the insulation. But the vertical movement, of course, will be quite different to the central movement, which will be much bigger. So the central movement at LVDT1 will be much bigger. So there's a relative movement between the two. So that means that the upper wide is effectively taking, uh, effectively deforming a great deal more than the lower one. Now the lower one will move uh, because it's, but it's much stiffer. So it'll have very little movement. And what happens eventually then is at point C is the upper wide, the differential displacement between uh, um, LVT1 and 2, for example, will be so large that a crack will occur in the upper wide. Now, it still is residual capacity, of course, because it's got fibers in it. But um, what happens then is as the load is increased, if you look at the photograph on the right, is that the uh, ends of the upper wide start to lift off the insulation. And so as we go from C to D to E, eventually the insulation is so compressed that actually the upper, the, the lower uh, beam uh, uh, or wide uh, starts then to take a significant proportion of the load. We're not squashing the insulation anymore, which has got lots of displacement capacity, as you know. So from at the point D, the load is effectively, remember, we're moving the displacement, we're moving the head of the actuator. So it's only when we get to D does the uh, uh, bottom wide start to take more load. And you can see D to E to F is the bottom wide uh, um, uh, taking the load, and then it fails at F. If you look at the photograph on the right, uh, which is obviously somewhat ridiculous, insofar as we can see there's two very well-developed cracks in the top Y, that the middle directly underneath the load uh, uh, um, spreader. Uh, but um, because of the way in, in which the uh, insulation works, it has a sufficient capacity to be able to lift up uh, the ends of uh, the uh, top Y very, very substantially indeed. Uh, so it's basically just taking the self weight and the load is effectively transferred straight through uh, um, the upper wide directly into the lower wide. And now you can see there's a crack developed there. This is post cracking uh, before we took it apart. And you can see a very well developed crack on the bottom uh, of the bottom wide, the stiffer one. So I think we have a good understanding as to how when we've no connection between the two of them uh, and we have a thick lower panel, I think because of what we saw before, we have a good understanding. Now, let me just give you an example of when we have a bridge between the two. And we discovered this when actually we had some leakage uh, between the top and the bottom. We didn't do it on purpose. And we found there was a 10 millimeter uh, uh, wedges, if you like, uh, or webs of, of concrete uh, happened to pass down through the insulation between the top and the bottom, unfortunately. So when we tested those, and we thought we might as well, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, what we found was, Actually, a thin web, even 10 millimeters, is enough to get us a high degree of uh, um, composite behavior. And the way we did that was to plot the load displacement plot, where in the diagram in the middle, if you look at the red dotted line on the right, that's where the two wides, based on the calculation I, I, or equations I gave you earlier, that's the fully elastic response of two separate wides, load displacement. Um, so you can see it's not stiff at all. Now, it takes no account, of course, of what happens when you get high displacements and you get nonlinear behavior. But supposing it remained elastic all the way up, that's what it would look like. On the other hand, the black dotted line on the left hand side with the arrow against it, that's um, the theoretical calculation for how stiff it would be. Uh, uh, says nothing about the low capacity, but that would how stiff it would be if you had fully composite wides. And what you can see is the green line is the one where we had seepage during manufacture. And if you look at the start of that curve, which is highlighted in red, you can clearly see uh, that the stiffness of that is such that it's closer to fully composite than it is to non-composite. In other words, even with a 10 millimeter uh, uh, junction between the two, if you could rely on that, you would end up with a reasonably high degree of composite behavior. And we know that because we then proceeded to, to actually do some tests with 100 millimeter webs, which we put in deliberately 
And we found that the early stiffness was this more or less the same. And while we got a, a better behavior post cracking, uh, uh, and these were fiber reinforced, but we got better behavior post cracking. Uh, there wasn't a huge difference between the two. In other words, any degree of connectivity using concrete uh, will give you reasonably good composite behavior. Now that turns out to be important because when we look at the ones with the non-conductive shear connectors, we see completely different behavior. So let me just explain the theory anyway of what happens when we actually tie down the edges. So that was when they weren't connected. So when we connect them, the edges are not going to be free to lift because either the grid or the studs will hold down the edges. So a typical beam and an elastic uh, uh, foundation bending moment diagram looks as it appears on the, on the right hand side. That is no bending at the edge of the plate, uh, a maximum sagging in the middle, giving rise to tension on the bottom and uh, uh, hogging some way removed from that with uh, tension on the top. So if you look on the left hand side as to the stages we expect is once we get to the elastic limit, you can see the two uh, orange lines. I'd expect a crack just at the edge of the load applicator. Then as we go on, uh, we come to the second bending moment diagram, the one on the right where it can't take any more moment. So the incremental bending moment diagram. So we've got a fully plastic moment there at that joint. So the incremental bending moment diagram, we can't add any more moment at the center because it's fully plasticized. And therefore uh, um, the, the hoggy moments in the top diagram and the lower diagram will add together and lo and behold, we get a crack uh, uh, starting at the top and then propagating downwards uh, the complete opposite of the first crack. Uh, and then in the third stage, as you can see, the lowest diagram on the left is that we get a crack starting on the bottom in the thicker wide spreading towards the top. So that's what we expect to happen in theory. So let's take a look and see what does happen. So first of all, let's take a look at the diagram on the left. <clears throat> so I'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, um, and it's the blue one I'm particularly interested. The blue one is the displacement transducer in the center of the beam on the top wide. So initially, um, the load is applied, and then at around about 20 kilonewtons, you can see the upper wide cracks, but it has more capacity because of the fibers. And then as it levels off, uh, the fibers are now pulling out relatively easily. And now the insulation starts to crush. And this top diagram, which I'm referring to on the left, is using grids, by the way. And that's important because the insulation is crushing here and we're getting lots of displacement for no increase of load because unfortunately the grid is relatively useless here uh, underneath the load because underneath the load it's in compression. And as you know from an earlier diagram, uh, it'll just buckle, it won't have any compressive resistance. Now the grid is still useful at the edges because it's very good in tension. So uh, if you look at the photograph on the right hand side, you can clearly see uh, that the edges have not lifted, but there's clearly compression occurring underneath the load uh, spreader. And then uh, when the uh, eventually you get engagement, as we saw before, of the lower wide, then the lower wide cracks and it fails. Now, just, just a very quick look uh, to see what happens. Um, the green curve here is the lower wide, and you can see it takes the load right up to 80, and then it cracks, and then it loses its load. Uh, and the yellow and the, and the red are the uh, displacement transducers at the left and the right hand ends. Now I want to compare that with what happens with the pins because it's quite different. So here, as you might expect, what happens with the pins, the behavior is somewhat different insofar as um, the pins are much stiffer actually. So underneath the load spreader, um, the, uh, effectively the amount of displacement which takes place in the top uh, is significantly reduced. So as a consequence of that, uh, um, there's a much lower displacement in the upper wide because what effectively happens is the load has a better share between the top and the bottom, not by virtue of composite behavior per se in terms of the shear behavior, but because the compressive force on the top is transferred through to the bottom and shared with the bottom wide. And we can see that on the, on the lower diagram on the left, because um, you, can, you can see uh, if you look closely and superimpose one on top of the other, is that there's a better uh, or a larger displacement occurring uh, at the same point in time with the lower wide. In other words, the lower wide takes more of the load because the arrangement up above it uh, has a better way of transferring it to the middle of the slab as distinct from distributed. But also the pins, it's good to see the pins at the end uh, uh, have been in tension, they haven't pulled out, and it's good to see at the left and the right end, end that in fact uh, we're not getting pull out of the pins. <clears throat> 
So it's doing its job in tension and indeed in compression as well. So here uh, at the top right and at the top left, um, I'm just going to move my image just for a moment. Uh, at the top right and the top left, uh, you can clearly see for the grids, uh, I've highlighted the fact that not only is there a permanent displacement uh, underneath the uh, load spreader, but also there's a crack at the right hand side. So that was the hogging crack starting from the top. So there's uh, effectively two plastic or three plastic hinges here, one underneath the load and one uh, somewhat removed from the load application on the left and the right, uh, exactly as predicted by the theory. Whereas on the bottom right hand corner with the FOP pins uh, at the same stage of loading, they both take about uh, 80 uh, kilonewtons because they both have the same bottom wide. The bottom wide determines the peak load and it's exactly the same. So therefore roughly the loads are the same for both the peak loads. Whereas what's different here is if you look closely, you can see on the bottom right hand diagram is the pins uh, at the same under the same load have shown very little vertical a displacement and that proved was of course that the that the grids really are not good under compressive loads. Now just developing this a little bit further, um, we were tempted very much when we go for a thicker amount of insulation. So this is where we go for very thick insulation. Uh, we were tempted to put in a uh, effectively a, a drop or a ridge uh, in it. So you can see the difference between C and D, where along the length of the span, uh, we want to get slightly better bond, particularly when we got a, a very deep insulation. So in the bottom left-hand photograph there, you can see the size of those ridges that we put in. And indeed, in the middle photograph on the left, you can actually see the bottom bit cast in, waiting for us to put in the insulation, and, and then the top bit will be cast in at the top as well. So there's a subtle difference between these two, and that's shown by some finite element analysis, which we did on the right hand side. We've done a lot of finite element analysis of how these behave and how the different parameters affect the results. But this is an important one, because <clears throat> if you look at the upper of the two finite element results, what you can clearly see is the case we've already seen. And that is that the stresses in the top wide, when you have a deep bottom wide, uh, are significantly higher. And just to emphasize that point again, is that the bottom wide is simply supported at the edges and that the load is transferred through the insulation and not through the actual grid itself because it can't uh, transmit compression. Uh, so therefore, the uh, top wide is a beam and an elastic foundation. Its edges do move downwards underneath that compressive load. But when we move to the bottom wide, the two wides on the bottom are the same thickness. So as a consequence, something interesting happens here because the top wide has a smaller relative displacement because the edges move down because the, compression, the insulation compresses compared to the lower wide. So while they have a good load share, if you have the pins in there instead of the grid, if you've got the pins in there instead of the grid, you get a good load share between the two. So the top and the bottom more or less share the load equally at the start because they're connected by the pins. And therefore, it's actually the lower wide which fails first. So the lower wide fails first because it's rigidly supported at the ends. It's much more like a simply supported beam uh, as, or slab as compared with the one above, which is a simply supported, uh, uh, sorry, it's a slab, which is on an elastic foundation. And if you look closely at the upper, uh, sorry, the lower finite element diagram, you can clearly see, see that the deflection in the upper wide is smaller than the deflection in the lower one. And as a consequence, the lower one fails first. Now, what this means is that if we use these uh, uh, sandwich panels on the outside of a building, if you get too large a load on the outside of the building, it can crack on the inside without knowing it on the outside. So you have to be very careful that you design it in such a way that the outside always fails before the inside uh, so that you can actually see the failure clearly. So let's take a look at what happens when we've got very deep insulation. This is where you're going for very, uh, very um, uh, uh, low U values. So what happens here again, just looking at the diagram, the upper diagram on the left hand side, uh, again, uh, with deep insulation is we get a crack occurring in the bottom. Uh, and what happens now is uh, without the pins uh, is effectively the bottom provides nothing except uh, the pullout resistance, uh, and there is some pullout resistance, but because the bottom one has failed, and I've just explained why the bottom one fails first in the previous diagram, now the top wide, unlike the previous case, now the top wide is taking all the load. So the top wide is now taking all the load. Uh, again, you get some resistance, uh, about 0.5 a kilonewton from the insulation, as we saw before. Uh, you get some pullout resistance from the bottom, but not much. And the top one eventually cracks, 
uh, as you can see between uh, just to the left of D, uh, there's some slip out there at D, the top one cracks. Uh, and then we have uh, three, three contributors. First of all, the pullout resistance of the top wide, any residual pullout resistance of the bottom, if there is anyway, is any, and also the insulation itself in flexor, which will have some resistance. Interesting also in the photograph on the right hand side, um, we drew a vertical straight line using a marker of the uh, five pieces of uh, um, insulation, which were not connected by anything more than silicone. And at this stage, uh, after the failure load, you can clearly see that there has been shear movement between the insulation sheets. You can see the staggering uh, of that vertical line, giving us a very indication, a good indication that staggering has taken place. Now compare that with the lower diagram, which is when the pins are in. So the difference between the two is now the pins are in place, uh, these FRP pins, which are the stiffer ones. And therefore, um, if you look at the scale on the left-hand side, uh, first of all, um, the sharing of the load is much better. We're not relying on the insulation to share the load. Uh, now the pins will share the load. Uh, we have a rib in there as well to make sure the pins are embedded. And furthermore, um, uh, what you see is that the cracking load, which is highlighted in red on the left-hand side, is much higher, five kilonewtons compared with two and a half. So that's because of the pins sharing the load between the top one and the bottom one. And then when it does crack, uh, uh, because the pins are there, the pin effectively holds it together. So you get more contribution from the bottom. And the failure load is now 10 kilonewtons or 11 kilonewtons instead of three or four kilonewtons. So you can see the pins substantially add uh, to the tying together of the two. And while there is some shear movement, you can see it again on the right hand photograph, there is some shear movement and the pins are actually holding this together. So. <clears throat> This is deflected so much that the insulation is, is torn, unlike the previous case, and um, there's some shear movement. The bottom is clearly not providing any resistance whatsoever, uh, and any residual load now is provided probably by the fibers pulling out in the top. So you've got a very good idea as to uh, what's contributing to the various stages of crack, first cracking, post-cracking ductility, and then ultimately the failure. So the, the numbers of maximum on the maximum load are quite interesting. It gives us a lot of indication. So first of all, the insulation provides about 0.5 on its own in flexure, which is the test we did. And um, the wides without the ribs about 3.4 kilonewtons. When the ribs are added, it only adds a little bit more, but not a lot. And then um, not understandably, uh, understandably should I say, the unconnected wides, thin wides, they don't really add much more than a wide without ribs. Yeah, if there's no rib there. And the reason for that, of course, is the thicker uh, uh, wide underneath provides just simply a solid base. And it's always the top one which has to take a significant amount of the resistance. And then finally, the one we want to see, which is the connected tin wide. And this is with the stud connector. So with the stud connector, the only one of these that has a shear connection, you can clearly see that the peak and maximum load is substantially higher uh, than the sum of the parts, if you like. Um, I mean, you could say that you got two uh, 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 single wides there together, you'd expect if you put the two of them together, you'd expect maybe six or seven uh, uh, um, uh, maximum. And you're getting 50% more than that due to the shear behavior between the two. And then finally, uh, that was on short panels. Now the importance of the short panel is that there's not a lot of slipping taking, uh, sorry, there's not a lot of bending, I beg your pardon, taking place. So on the longer spans, we've got a lot more bending. So here you can see are some panels that we made up full length ones. And uh, again, they were made in the precast factory. And you can see here, after we put the insulation in, you can see the top of the grids there in the middle photograph, waiting for the concrete to be poured. And you can see um, the uh, beams ready to be tested on, or the slab, should I say, ready to be tested on the right hand side. And just a couple of things to note, um, I'm almost finished now, just a few more slides. Um, a couple of things to note is you can see the difference in the stiffness at the left hand end, uh, because we did some with pins and some without pins, but you can see the stiffness at the left hand side difference uh, between uh, the pin connector, which is the blue one, which is stiffer as we saw before, and also the uh, grid, which is less stiff. And that's fine for the initial until uh, the first crack occurs. But then there's a difference in the behavior afterwards. And let me explain why. We saw from the direct shear test on the pin connectors, which we saw at the horizontal test earlier, we saw that the pins weren't very good laterally because basically they're going to move. If you just see my hands on the screen, they're going to move sideways like that. What happens with the grid though, with the crisscross pattern is that 
Some of them are going to go into tension, some of the compression, we can ignore the ones in compression. So the ones that are in tension as it wants to move laterally will effectively form a truss of compression in the insulation, tension in the grid, compression in the insulation, tension in the grid. And by virtue of that, when you start to get large deflections, you can clearly see that the residual load capacity of the grids is much better. Now, there's no, remember, there's no direct force here. This is pure bending, only bending, only lateral shear is the big issue here. So the pins do not do well in lateral shear, even though they have a better load shear at the start. So they do not do as well in lateral shear, whereas the grid overcoming its weakness, if you like, which is the, uh, uh, the compression that takes place underneath the load. Uh, once we start getting large deflections, in other words, the, the post cracking behavior, if that's of interest, because you may not be interested in the post cracking behavior if you have a serviceability criteria, but if you are interested in the failure mode and the post crackling uh, behavior, then you can clearly see that the grid is better. And a very positive photograph is the photograph on the right hand side, where we can clearly see that although there are no ribs in the upper wide, you can see the upper wide here, there's no ribs, that small amount of embedment is enough to fail the, G, uh, the FRP. The grid has actually failed rather than pulled out, as you can see. And that's a very positive indicator with regard to the embedment uh, and the bond uh, of the top of the grid. And that's a very positive sign. We didn't actually need, uh, in this case here, we didn't actually need um, the... Uh, um, uh, ridges, the, the, the downstands, to give us enough grip, and that's very positive. So to finish up with, um, there are lots of other uh, indicators that we looked at, and I'll just mention a couple of ones. Uh, the one on the left-hand side indicates the very significant improvement if you just make a small difference to the wide thickness. So if you take, for example, uh, technically speaking, the, the benefit of the parallel axis theorem when it comes to working out the second moment of area is that if you increase one of the wides, not both of them, but one of the wides from 25 to, to, to 40 millimeter, you can see that you get a very significant increase in the capacity. So we shouldn't forget that the uh, upper and lower flanges, if you like to call it that, of a successfully uh, uh, shear connected uh, uh, slab uh, has a much better performance if you increase the size of the flange. And the second one on the right hand side, um, you can see with 10 millimeters, uh, sorry, 10 kilograms uh, per cubic meter of fibers, uh, we do see a benefit. That's the green line. Uh, again, it's not nearly as effective as a composite, uh, uh, because if you look at it's about halfway between the red dotted line and the black, which was the non-composite and the fully composite. So this is not as good as the other ones we were looking at earlier. Uh, but if you increase the fiber content, then you can clearly see that you get a, a much better post-cracking response. And then finally, the one on the right-hand side, uh, just to, uh, to show you, uh, is that uh, if you increase the insulation, not the, st not the strength, but the stiffness of the insulation, uh, you can get uh, the flexural rigidity overall of the panel increases quite substantially. So anything you can do to increase the strength of the insulation and the stiffness of the insulation uh, would give you a more rigid panel because of the importance of the insulation uh, in the process of developing uh, uh, um, uh, post-cracking behavior uh, in a composite panel. So to conclude and finish with, um, uh, thank you again uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, give this uh, keynote address. And to summarize, uh, so far as the rigid shear connectors are concerned, uh, we get very good composite action, and, and that's why they've been used so, so frequently. But if we want to move towards much better thermal performances of buildings, then we really have to move to the non-conductive shear connectors. Now, just in the rigid ones, we, particularly with the plates that we spoke about, we have to be very careful about our design of the plate geometry, uh, because what we do know is that um, if we use too thin a plate, then buckling dominates and we don't reach the types of rotational failures or the back face uh, um, uh, cracking uh, uh, failures, and uh, it fails prematurely in buckling. So you've got to be very careful of that. On the other hand, with the non-conductive uh, uh, shear connectors, we're only interested in the serviceability criteria, then the studs are much better at sharing the load between the two through its compressive strength. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're interested in post-cracking behavior, we've clearly shown that the grid type ones uh, uh, overcome their weakness in, in, in compression by holding down the ends, as indeed the the pins do, but more importantly, when you get large lateral uh, um, uh, shear uh, movement taking place uh, uh, due to the absence of good composite behavior is that uh, the grid uh, uh, is much better at resisting uh, uh, and providing a higher load capacity uh, at the higher degrees of displacement to post-cracking.
So that completes uh, uh, my talk. I hope there was something uh, of interest uh, to you there. And uh, I hope to be able to join you uh, very shortly uh, during the actual set or at the end of the actual session itself uh, to answer any questions uh, that you might have for me. So again, many thanks indeed for uh, the honour uh, and distinction that you have given to me by inviting me uh, to present this.